This video concerns the chief revolutionary of the novel, Pyotr Stepanovich. He arrives near the end of part one and seems to create chaos with which that part ends, including the Shatov slap. He appears throughout book two, especially in rallying his revolutionary troops and in playing the liberals to his advantage. Pyotr enters officially in part one, chapter five, the wise serpent, section five. He is described like this in an utterly contradictory way, dressed in clean and even fashionable clothes, but not foppishly, a bit hunched and slack at first sight, and yet not hunched at all, even easygoing. No one would call him bad looking, but no one likes his face. The expression of his face is as if sickly, but it only seems so. There are other contradictions. He is playing a part, and it is difficult to know what he is or what it is. There is nothing straightforward about this guy. I could say a lot about his activities in giving rise to all the confusion in parts one and two. Many people have gotten anonymous letters sowing discontent and confusion. Rumors swirl. Slaps and swooning happen. Someone has egged on Mr. Gaganov to challenge Stravogin to a duel. Initially, our narrator claims that all happened as a result of surprising conversion of accidents. But by the beginning of part two, our narrator and Stepan Tropinovich conclude, reflecting on the past events, that the one and only person who could be to blame for spreading the rumors was Pyotr Stepanovich. They were not accidents at all. They were a part of Pyotr's plan for demoralizing and revolutionizing the town. Dostoevsky continues telling the story of moral and social chaos spreading in the province in Chapter 4, entitled All in Expectation. He sketches how Pyotr Stepanovich finds unprincipled, willing dupes just ready to be manipulated. Thinking so well of themselves, they can hardly think badly of anyone else unless that person opposes progress. Pyotr is the revolutionary terrorist, and he follows Necheyev's catechism of a revolutionary to a T. We can learn about Pyotr through comparing him to that catechism, in fact. I want to lay out Necheyev's strategy for a revolution and then show how Pyotr Stepanovich follows that strategy in the novel. I will do this to develop his char character carefully and to show what that character entails in the drama of the novel. The 14th plank of Necheya's Catechism of Re Revolutionary is this. The revolutionary may and frequently must live within society while pretending to be completely different from what he really is, for he must penetrate everywhere into all the higher and middle classes into the houses of commerce. This is precisely what everyone always says about Pyotr Stepanovich, and even what he says about himself. He plays a part. The eighth plank of the catechism reads as follows. The degree of friendship and devotion and obligation towards such a comrade is determined solely by the degree of his usefulness to the cause of total revolutionary destruction. Pyotr delivers his most striking and easily forgotten secret about his revolution, namely that he is using everyone else only to Strafogin. Everyone else is a mere dupe, tricked into acting for the cause and thinking that this is both a national and an international scheme. As he tells Stravogin in their first one-on-one -on -one meeting, when I set out to come here to this town 10 days ago, I decided, of course, to adopt a role, and that was the role of a local affiliate of an international conspiracy. That cell he treats like baby jackdaws in the nest, fed when the mother wants. Shatov seems to know about Pyotr's alleged relation to the international throughout, as he says to Stravogin during Stravogin's visit later that night. Pyotr tells different kinds of lies to different kinds of people for different purposes in these circumstances. Again, this is right out of Necheyev's playbook. 
Necheyev identifies five groups in the filthy social, social order who must all be eliminated or revolutionized. First, in Plank 15, this category comprises of those who would be condemned to death without delay, according to the relative gravity of their crimes. Here, our example is Shatov, whom Pyotr sees as a traitor. He tries to get others to take care of Shatov and denounces Shatov to Servojin in Part 2, Chapter 1, entitled Night. He denounces Shatov to the province's new governor, von Lemke, as the author of a revolutionary tract, Shining Light, in the chapter entitled Pyotr Stepanovich Bustles About, Section 3. He arranges things with Shatov so that when he goes to the common meeting with the, uh, with the people, with our people, Shatov sits quietly like an informant and leaves without taking the pledge for revolutionary action. This prepares the revolutionary cell to move against Shatov, to murder him, in part three of the book. Necheyev talks about another category of people in Plank 18. The great brutes in high places distinguished neither by their cleverness nor their energy, while enjoying riches, influence, power, and high positions by virtue of their rank. These must be exploited in every possible way. They must be implicated and embroiled in our affairs. Their dirty secrets must be ferreted out, and they must be transformed into slaves. No one is turned into a slave of Pyotr Stepanovich more than the governor's wife, Julia Mikhailovna. Pyotr had, by page 323 in Before the Fete, acquired a strangely strong influence over Yulia Mikhailovna. Von Lemke, the governor, found it difficult to take action against Pyotr and the youngsters because his wife was so enmeshed with them. Our narrator even blames Yulia's self-importance and ambition for the bad little people have managed to do. Much of it is her responsibility, our narrator says. Pyotr exploits Yulia's desire to be a radical chic and to be at the center of everything against her and her desire to be relevant to the young. She herself has had no children, it seems to imp important to mention. The next category discussed in Plank 19 of Necheya's Catechism is ambitious office holders and liberals of various shades of opinion. The revolutionary must pretend to collaborate them blindly, following them, while at the same time prying out their secrets until they are completely in his power. They must be so compromised that there is no way out for them, and then they can be used to create disorder in the state. This is how Pyotr manipulates Governor von Lemke in two very memorable scenes. One from All in Expectation, Section 3, and another from Pyotr Stepanovich Bustles About, Section 3. Pyotr shows contempt for von Lemke's liberalism when von Lemke tries to get him to cool it down with a we are all on the same team but with different strategies, fellow traveling liberal speech. He seeks to buy time to organize action in bustles about, and even chastises the governor for not using harsher methods against the discontented workers in a nearby factory. Pyotr suggests that he is this close to breaking up the revolutionary cell for the governor, and he just needs six more days. The governor even hands over an anonymous letter to Pyotr, claiming that a revolution is brewing just before he leaves that meeting. Pyotr's manipulation of this liberal governor shows that the governor is a truly useful idiot, whose wife is more an idiot than useful. Another category from Plank 20 of Necheya's Catechism are those doctrinaires, conspirators, and revolutionists who cut a great figure on paper or in cliques. They must be constantly driven on to make compromising declarations. As a result, the majority of them will be destroyed, while a minority will become genuine revolutionaries. 
This group is lampooned in chapter seven with our people, one of the most hilarious chapters in the book. More needs to be said about the relationship between the intellectuals and the revolutionaries, but let it suffice to say for now that they debate pedantic issues, whether the meeting is actually a meeting. Lysham begins presenting his 12 volume account of revolutionary necessity in this chapter. And finally, Pyotr makes them choose revolution through violence or not, a snail's pace through the swamp or full steam across it. And the whole crowd is forced to say yes or to be perceived as a snitch. Once they participate in a murder, they will either be dedicated to Pyotr's cause or have to give themselves up. Pyotr even clips his fingernails throughout the debating just to show what he thinks of it. This is not some esoteric reading of demons I am offering. Pyotr Stepanovich is the chief revolutionary, and he follows the basic arc of a revolutionary as defined by Russia's chief revolutionary, Sergei Necheyev. I could include other planks, to be sure. Plank 10 talks about second and third tier revolutionaries who must be used as common revolutionary capital, as the circumstances warrant as resources to be spent, not as people to be valued. I could go on. The action of part two, chapters four through seven, mainly concerns Pyotr playing the part he needs to play. We don't know what the plan is yet, but there is a plan. We know that Stravogin plays an important part in the plan. We know that Pyotr needs to use this south. We know that some people must be destroyed. I have mentioned that Shatov is one of those on the chopping block. We should understand why he is so important before going more deeply into the plans of this revolutionary South. 